So, so I'm going to ask. Um, I'm going to ask not about the shows that you've done. I'm going to ask you. You, 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 you come out of school, you decide to become a, a director, a producer, you start in television, you're a writer initially, right? You sold your first script when you were actually in college. Uh, I, I began as a, a writer and, and wrote some movies and then got into television after that, yeah. So, so I'm imagining that you're, you're, you're on your first set, you're, the, you're a director, you, you, you have no management training up till now, right? How, what is that like? How do you learn to become a manager? Because when a movie or a TV show comes together, there's what, hundreds, thousands of people that suddenly are looking to you for leadership and guidance on what they're supposed to do. You bring up a great point, uh, which is that, uh, what the hell am I doing here? Um, <laughs> and what, what I mean is, uh, it, it is, it is obviously patently absurd that I'm here talking to you uh, about <laughs> running, managing uh, companies, <laughs> because I just know uh, uh, fuck all about that. What I do <laughs> is, uh, it's, it's instinct, it's intuition, it's experimentation, and it's the golden rule of treating people the way you want to be treated. Uh, but it, it, was, it was a little less nerve-wracking the first time I was directing professionally because it was on a TV show, uh, episode 12, of a show that uh, I had co-created. And so I knew the cast, and I knew the crew. So it wasn't so scary. It was a little, it was sort of a gentle way in. And and let me ask, what are the big mistakes that you make at first, right? Because if anyone in this company, or anyone in this room walked into a, a funder, a startup, or, or walked into a company and said, I'm your new CEO, um, it's, it's, it's day 12 or product 12 of this company, and by the way, I'm your new boss, I'm going to be telling you what to do. It, it's terrifying, and you're bound to make mistakes at first. What did you, what, what's the lesson that you're learning from? Well, in terms of, of working uh, on a, a series or a, or a movie, uh, the, the biggest mistake you make, and this is not news to anyone, is, uh, is working with the wrong people. Huh. You know, th when you work with someone, when you hire someone, an, an actor, uh, a crew member who, you know, if you have the choice to make, uh, or the opportunity to make a choice, uh, you want people who will do their job uh, better than you could do their job. You don't want to be micromanaging and babysitting. You want to be relying, because they're relying on you, you're relying on them, and, and so there's that. The, in terms of uh, a company, uh, Bad Robot, which is our company, right. um, which has uh, 86 employees, uh, it's, it's a small production company, but uh, you know, th there have been, there are always missteps, and you always figure things out and iterate, and I think uh, you know, one of them is we've had this visual effects wing of the company, which has become a very large part of our company, and we're looking at ways, you know, to, you know, realizing we want to be a place that is is creating the ideas, not necessarily finishing them, um, and 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 understanding, you know, that the company uh, benefits from uh, having departments that aren't necessarily bottom line contributors, meaning uh, they have sort of the, their collateral benefits to uh, things like we have a, a, a division called Good Robot. Which is uh, the, you know the the kind of social uh, side of things, the the more charitable side. We have a a, a division that's an interactive division that's actually it looks like it's doing better than anyone thought it would, doing really really well now. Um, uh, and that's not the meat and potatoes TV and movie side. Uh, we we have uh, an art room that is has an old Chandler and Price letterpress that we use all the time. We have large format printers and embroiderers and book binders and uh, all these different machines and equipment that we use to make things all the time. We have a music studio. Uh, all these different things have allowed us to do an incredible number of things in-house that have actually benefited the larger projects but are not in any way obvious pieces of a production company. That's interesting. So, and when you start Bad Robot and you, you say, I'm the CEO of this company, What's your design? Like, are you thinking to yourself, this is how, this is what I want the culture of this company to be like? Do you find that it just grows organically? Well, my wife, Katie McGrath, who has uh, actually worked at actual companies, uh, <laughs> she uh, was, is, is always, uh, and she works at Bad Robot now, and she is kind of the uh, company whisperer. She, she looks at what we're doing and points out all the things that uh, she thinks could be better, could be, uh, could be run in a way that I would never even begin to think about. I knew when we were building the building, uh, I designed it with Andy Waisler, the architect. You know, so, for example, things like the kitchen at the center, where you walk in, there's a waiting room. I, I knew that I didn't want to have magazines. I wanted people to actually, you know, to encourage people to create things. So I literally designed the, the table that would be in the waiting room 
that would have paper and pens, uh, encouraging people to draw uh, pictures that we end up putting up on our walls, and then we, we make little uh, books at the end of the year, uh, knowing that I wanted to have you know, glass walls to look into the art studio, which I knew would be an unusual thing to have at a production company. Uh, everyone gathers together for breakfast and, and, and lunch at the company, and we serve really, we have very, uh, we're luckily, we have great, uh, uh, two great chefs who work there, and everyone comes together at lunch. Uh, there's a real community, and you know, listening earlier to Joey and Reed talk about uh, culture and, and defining your culture, that was from the building to the people to the way we work, a, a critical part of uh, what I was hoping Bad Robot would be and what, what Katie has helped it become. And let me ask about, because your basic product is innovation, right? You go into every, every new project saying, we don't know exactly what's going to come out the other side. We want it to be creative. We want it to be fa fascinating. We want it to delight people. How do you help employees tap into that innovation? Because creativity on demand is tough, right? It's, it's emotionally tough. It's pr procedurally tough. Well, look, it, it, it's, the, the truth is that, that every project is different, but at the same time, um, you need everyone to feel safe and comfortable to completely screw up and to um, try their best. I mean, when you see kids play and you see them, uh, you know, they don't care who's watching and they're in this kind of, you know, we lose that as we get older. And I think there's, there's that's the magic is whether it's on the page or in front of a camera, uh, whether it's the person whose responsibility it is to give notes about a scene or not, you know, they may be a, a, a gaffer, they may be working in the, in the camera department, but I try to create an environment where people feel valued and, uh, and, and important. And, and that we, I always have meetings at the beginning of every production where I say to every department head, and it's 80-some you know, people or whatever for every project, uh, that the most important thing for me is that we are treating people the way we want to be treated, but that everyone speak up. The thing that would kill me would be that at the premiere of something or after something is aired on, on television, people lean in and say, you know what, I, I, I thought that that could have been, you know, it's like, <laughs> that's not the time to make things better. Um, <laughs> And, and so, you know, uh, I was going to bring like some, you know, uh, like gag reel stuff of, uh, to kind of give a sense, I, I didn't, but to give a sense of, you'll, you'll thank me, but um, <laughs> uh, of, of kind of what it's like on the set of, of things. But I think it's really important that people feel that they are as important as anyone else, uh, that, that the, the mood is uh, safe so that people know it's okay to speak out if there's something that's not working quite the way it should. A little aside, um, we were working on, uh, I asked Chris Rock if he would help me with something uh, in New York in a month or so, and uh, I said to him, you know, if you need any help with the Oscars, let me know. <laughs> and, uh, and he sent me an email saying, I can't do that thing that you want to do, but yes, I need help with the Oscars. <laughs> so uh, I, I totally got screwed <laughs> in, in, in this email exchange. But uh, he said, we want to do this little behind, like this sort of deleted scenes piece uh, from some movies. And he, they sent me the script, and I said I would, I would help them out. So we did this piece. Uh, if you saw the Oscars, they were, they were showing some scenes from things like uh, the, the Danish Girl and the Martian and Revenant um, and Joy. And so we did these pieces. And, uh, and as we were working on the pieces, six employees at the company came to me and they said that they didn't think that this was working quite right, huh. that it was as good as it could be for this reason or that reason. They had some very good reasons. And so I went to Chris and I said, you know, these six employees came to me and said that they're concerned about this aspect of what we're doing. He stopped, he thought about it. We went, we rewrote some stuff, we reshot something, we brought someone in to do some ADR uh, voiceover work. Anyway, we, we changed it significantly and what aired on Sunday night was not what was going to air, and, and it was partly because these people who were working in our visual effects wing and post wing spoke up, and it was, it was one of those things, an, an example, and I, I sort of celebrated it on Monday morning with the company, that this kind of, uh, the, the sense of, of, of freedom and, and the import that you, if you have an opinion about something, that could shape the outcome, it doesn't mean it will always get adjusted, but if you don't speak up, and if we don't listen, 
uh, we're in danger of being in a bubble. We're, you know, you don't, we don't want to be surrounded by yes people, and that is a massive danger. Well, and I want to ask about that because you mentioned that you celebrated this change, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I think any, any executive, anyone in this room, any CEO would say, I don't want to be surrounded by yes men. I want to create an, an atmosphere where everyone treats each other the way they want to be treated, mm -hmm. where we're all free to say something. But we know that there's a huge gap between saying that and making that culture become real. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you think tactically about you're dealing with, with actors who I, I imagine you have to sort of give creative feedback I, I, in a way that they can hear it and they mm -hmm. don't become defensive. If you're, yes. if you're talking to folks who, who's gonna stand up and tell J.J. Abrams that he's making a bad decision on a movie, right? How do you get people <laughs> over that hump so that they actually feel uh, like they can do that? Well, I, I think that Part of it is not feeling like anyone's working f for me. That's interesting. Meaning, I, and I, I hear myself say this, and, and I know that it could be cynically viewed as uh, you know, a kind of semantic play, but I'll say to people, and I'm working with them on something, you know, I think it wants to be like this. Not, I want this. That's interesting. A and I, I do it not because I'm trying to convince them and get them to work with me and not realize they're working for me. I do it because I literally feel like I am there to serve the scene or the department uh, at the company. And, I, and I, I, I'm open to the better idea all the time. I mean, some of my favorite things I've ever been lucky enough to work on were things that came out of conversations with other people, sometimes actors, sometimes producers, other times writers, whatever. But like, the, the conversation is the, the place where you know, I feel energized, not because I, I know I'm gonna be right, but because I wanna be challenged. And I, I think kicking the tires, is it's the only way that things are gonna ever improve. And, and I think talking to actors, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's the thing of, you know, you want to see what they're gonna bring. I, I plan things as much as I can, but I love going to the set, and frankly to the company every day, not quite knowing what the hell I'm gonna do. And what I, what I mean by that is, um, if I know the intention of a scene or of meetings, and I go in, I don't plan exactly what I want to say in the meeting, or I don't plan exactly every single shot all the time. I'll know if I, if I have half a dozen or so shots I know I need to get. I'll draw them out, I'll have a shot list, but you show up, and I promise you there are things you could never in a million years have anticipated. The way the sun you know, looks on those trees, where the actors are standing, what they actually look like on that set, what the set actually looks like. All these details that you need to be open to the better idea. And so it's, yeah. I, I've said this before, but it's like, it's like you know, driving in, in the fog. You, know, you can make out where you're headed, but the closer you get to it, the more you realize the detours you have to make or the, the, the way you really want to go, or maybe your destination is different altogether. But some of my, my favorite things have been ideas that have come out of spontaneous discussions that with all the planning in the world would never have been seized upon. You know, it, it's interesting because Stanley McChrystal was on the stage earlier today and he said something very similar where he said, Wait, when I go out and I give orders, I want people to know what my intention is and then basically to listen to the order I should have okay, given Well, them. this is this is a problem like with something, you know, like previs where they, you do sort of animated, uh, sort of animatics or like kind of computer generated imagery of what a scene's gonna be. And it's something that a lot of people use now and it's very valuable, however, the problem with that is it's so literal huh. that there's very little room for interpretation. And so a lot of times, crew members start to emulate the previs in a way that is actually, I think, counterintuitive and, and actually, I think, detrimental to the, the, the quality of the scene. The thing that makes a set great is the way a painter, the way he or she paints that wall, not because they're trying to match something that's specifically shown to them. An example of that is we were working on a set for Star Wars, and we looked at the set, and I swear to God, it had this kind of CG feeling to it standing in the room. <laughs> and we realized it was because the painters literally took the images that they were given, these rendered images, and they created it. And we That's realized awesome. it was missing interpretation. And so I think that, that there's an enormous value in, in hiring, uh, working with the right people, but making sure that they have the freedom to put themselves into it. Uh, it's a little bit like that moment in David Cronenberg's The Fly when he he transports, teleports the steak. It kind of looks like a steak and it vaguely smells like a steak, but then he makes Gina Davis taste the steak. He doesn't do it himself. <laughs> and it tastes not like a steak. <laughs> and he realizes there was a certain magic. And, and I think there's something about being simply following you know, the, the, the numbers or you know, always coloring within the lines that actually 
is, I think, a problem. This might have been the first time that I've heard management advice based on the fly. I, I, I like that as an analogy. I have a whole brundle fly uh, <laughs> closing. I don't want to give it away. It's, it's, it's going to kill. Yeah. <laughs> well, but, so here's what's interesting about what you're saying. There's a certain amount of ambiguity and, and tension involved in saying, I'm going to walk in. I don't know exactly how we're going to get to the place that I need to be. And, and when you're working on something that's a pet project, there's no expectations. If you have a startup, nobody expects that startup necessarily to knock it out of the park. Yeah. But Star Wars, yeah. nobody comes to Star Wars saying, yeah, it might be OK, it might not. We'll see what, we'll see what JJ ends up doing with it. How do you manage for yourself, and more importantly, for everyone around you, the tension and the expectations, right? Because it must have been up here walking well, into that. It, it was, it, it's a crazy thing. I mean, it, it, it's a great relief to sort of talk about it in the past tense, uh, finally. <laughs> um, it, it got really hard in the last couple months when literally hundreds of people a day would say to me, and often in, in interviews on camera, uh, how do you deal with the pressure? How do you deal with it? The pressure must be killing you. I, I heard that so many times that after a few weeks, I was like, oh my god, the fucking pressure. I'm gonna, oh my god. Like, it, was, it was really insane. Um, I will say that, that the key to that, there were two things. One is we knew, all of us, going into this, there was no version of this movie that was ever going to be the underdog. Like The beauty of a startup is that it, it sort of, it can come out of nowhere. The challenge, of course, is how do you get attention? The problem with Star Wars is, you know, not, not that people are gunning against it, but there's a level of expectation and anticipation Absolutely. of what it must be. So we all knew that going in. My only kind of sav was looking around and seeing people like Damondell, the DP, or, or Roger Guyette, the visual effects supervisor, or Don Gilliam, uh, the script supervisor, um, uh, people who were so good and so uh, reassuring because they were just so helpful. The cast, we knew we had an amazing cast. So once I kind of got past my own stupid personal issue, and I knew, of course, the cost of getting to live a childhood fantasy is going to be stress and pressure. Uh, and I'm okay with all that. The, the thing that was kind of uh, the most fun was, and it was amazing to me that it worked, was when we were on the set of that movie. This was Star Wars. It was hundreds of millions of dollars with all this stuff and all the stuff that you, know, you can imagine. But there was a feeling on set that was one of, uh, of, uh, of delight, of kind of, uh, of exploration. It felt closer, I swear to God, to making Super 8 movies when I was a kid than it did anything else I'd ever worked on. And, and there were times when there, were, there would be hundreds of extras, there would be times when we'd have all these ships that were actually built and on. And because we were all kind of excited to be there, we were able to suddenly come up with ideas for a shot. This is one shot, one little thing, when this one character, Oscar Isaac, playing Poe, kind of jumps down from an X-Wing and he comes around and, and then Finn, John Boyega, is coming this way and he pats him on the shoulder and he goes off. It, it's this little shot, but it was one of those things that like, I was looking around, we were in between things, in between shots, and the light was a certain way and we had the steady cam, all the, everyone was there. I was like, wait, 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 hold on, so let's, let's try this. And we did it, and in 20 minutes we had this shot that wasn't you know, on the, uh, in the script or anything that we needed to get. But it was one of those things that was, it reminded me of being a kid, making movies, and you suddenly look down the street and go, oh, this would be cool. And there's something to that magic of, oh, you know what would be cool? That you can't, I think through osmosis, the audience can feel when an actor or a director or a writer or, you know, finds inspiration in something and tries it. And I think that, that if you don't have that, if you're just following the, the rules or listening to the noise, you get paralyzed and, and no one benefits. There's something about the high wire act that everyone knows that you're on that high wire that makes it exciting to watch, right? They, they, at any moment I could ask you the wrong question, we all fall apart, but the fact that you're watching this happen, you can feel that excitement. I think that, well, it's interesting because I think we live in a, an age of artifice. I mean, everything, people don't believe what they see at all anymore, you know, in terms of movies. I was at uh, uh, UCLA, there was a screening of, of Safety Last, uh, with the, the old Harold Lloyd movie where he's climbing the clock tower. Uh, and it was a thousand or so people, and I swear to God, the audience was screaming when he was climbing and like you know almost falling off, and you know because they knew it was real. Now of course it wasn't real; it, he didn't actually climb a clock tower, but he he was brilliant and he made it look like he did. But the point is that that there is a kind of uh, there, there there is a, a magic to seeing something that feels real, and because Star Wars, of course, is never going to be real, you have to find real 
in the smallest moments. That's interesting. And, and that to me, you know, having people like this new actress Daisy Ridley, or of course Harrison, Carrie Fisher, all these people who were just so wonderful to work with, allowed us to find moments that were actually funny and actually sweet and, and heartbreaking and surprising. Well, and I think one thing that people have said consistently about your work is that story is at the center of it, that you invest in the story. You don't rely on special effects. You don't rely on kind of the, the pomp and circumstance around it. Who said that? I just did. Really? Didn't you hear me just I've say I've never that? heard that. Because I, 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 I am like, I love special effects so much. But, I, I, yeah. but thank no you. no story. Can we end there? No? <laughs> How much do you find as a manager, as a CEO of Bad Robot, how much do you rely on stories? Are you telling people stories about themselves, about the work? Are you telling yourself a story about where I am in the narrative? Is that how you manage kind well, of the... Well, I mean, what we try to do is, uh, is create an environment that is where people are valued, where there's a, a value proposition outside of the job description and what they do at work. So that, you know, whether it's paying for the health care for you know, the, every employee and their families. And uh, um, obviously, it, we, don't, we don't count uh, sick days or vacation days. And, uh, and, and of course, these things uh, are all about being a, a team player. I mean, we more often than not have to encourage people to take vacations than, than try to get, tell them to come home. But, um, but the, the work, uh, the narrative is, I, I think, uh, one of, of value, not just within the company, but within the community. And, and it, it's not that uh, what we do is, uh, is, is cheap or, or even unique. I mean, I, I'd like to think that this is something that is, is fairly common. But what, what seems to happen is that people invest themselves in ways that don't necessarily fit their, their job description. So for example, That's interesting. Uh, Dave Baranoff, who runs our digital side, and you know, he and this guy, Andrew Kramer, who worked there, came up with this app that a, a few years ago was you know, app of the year uh, uh, at, for the, uh, at Apple, and it was this great little thing, and they have this new thing they're working on. But when we were doing this movie Cloverfield, Dave, uh, who started as my assistant, was someone who uh, ran this kind of online component. And we just brought him in to do some work for this new thing we're doing, which is uh, sort of a, a, a sister film called 10 Cloverfield Lane. And he's been working, though he's on the digital side, he's been working, uh, just working his ass off on this, this aspect of this uh, marketing for this Cloverfield movie. And it's like having someone who can kind of shift and sort of move over to this, you know, this area because he's good at it and because he, he loves it and it's valuable. Is, it's a great asset. Well, and believing know. that you're at a place that, lo that rewards you for doing that, well, right? That if you go outside your lane, that no one is going to slap your wrist. Michelle Rejwan, who was my assistant for a while, uh, who's now going to be a producer on episode nine, you know, she's, uh, she, she just excelled and did an amazing job working on, on episode seven with us, and Kathy Kennedy hired her to do that movie. Ben Rosenblatt, who uh, was working at Post at Paramount, came over to Bad Robot, and he, he grew this aspect, Kel Kelvin Optical it's called, uh, which is the visual effects side of things. And he's been overseeing you know, all sorts of production and, and, uh, and visual effects stuff uh, at the company. It's just been amazing to watch. We, in, we, in, we try to invest in people who have uh, incredible skills that aren't necessarily easily defined. That's interesting. But you just realize there's something about this person and almost to a person that has really paid off in dividends. And I want to leave some time for, for us to take questions from the audience. Before I do, I want to ask about um, Bad Robot and diversity, because this has been an issue mm -hmm. that's come up recently. The Academy Awards was all about this, right? This has been something, not just in entertainment. What's interesting about today is that this diversity issue about getting, getting voices you don't expect has come up again mm -hmm. and again and again. You wrote a memo just a couple of weeks ago to studios and to agencies saying, we want to see pitches that reflect the diversity of America. Well, what, what happened was, uh, obviously, the, the Oscar controversy was sort of a wake-up call to us. Uh, and it was, it was funny, because we people were saying to us at the time, oh, it was so great how you, know, you guys made uh, Star Wars, and you had uh, you know, a representative cast, and that was great. But what we realized was that it has to be a systemic approach. That's and so we contacted, and looking at the Oscar issue, the Oscar issue was symptomatic of a problem. It wasn't the problem. You know, the Oscars is the, the last you know, stop on the, on the, you know, the train. Um, the first stop is uh, what gets made. And, and there has been, obviously, a, uh, a, a white male community, for the most part. Uh, and I understand that there's a kind of knee-jerk uh, response to jobs available, going to someone you know. You might have the same points of reference. You might have a you know a lot of commonality. You know he looks like me. It's like there's, but the truth is that that 
that no uh, community is best served when with their, you know, the elite are in control, when there's only one, one group. And we realized we had to do something that was, uh, at least for us, a step. And how has the community we, reacted to that? Well, what, what happened was we sent an, an email to our agency, uh, Creative Artists Agency, and we said, we, from now on, a policy of Bad Robot is any list that we get for writers, directors, producers, you know, projects, they, it needs to be at the very least representative of this country. And we literally sent them uh, uh, you know, percentages, uh, a breakdown, and said, you know, we're happy, this, this is like the bare minimum, but please, we just don't want any more lists that look the way those lists look. And what's incredible is their response immediately was, great, we're on it. And the lists that we've been getting have immediately been, frankly, a more interesting uh, and inclusive lists. Huh. We also, uh, with Paramount and Warner Brothers, said the same thing to them. And what, all we're saying, it's not about a quota system, it's not saying we have to hire any one, one person. It's the simple task of, of saying, you know, let's choose from a pool that represents the community, the, the real community, not the created community, not the community that is the, the, the old guard. And this is something that, that won't go away. Audiences, you know, uh, the press, everyone knows this is happening. And I'm sure that there are some people who would like it to go away. And I know that when some people have said, oh, look, Star Wars, it, it's, it's become this big success, and there's a female in the lead, and a black man, and, and a Latino man you know, in the lead. And then there are some people who go, yeah, but that's Star Wars, it doesn't count. There's always an excuse as to why something doesn't matter uh, to those who feel threatened by it. But I gotta say, it's, it's about the bottom line. I think the better stories are gonna come from the more you know, inclusive voices. I think the, the audiences will go to see these movies, and I think that the, the bottom line will, will uh, increase, that will, will benefit uh, for this inclusivity. It's fascinating, because what you're talking about is not explicit keeping people out, right? It's just the, it's the totally unconscious bias of saying like, look, I, I got a list for you. This is all the people that you and I know and we, and we like. It, it's literally about opportunity. And, and, and when, when people aren't getting the opportunity to even be considered, there's no way they're gonna win an Oscar. Right, that's fascinating. Let's go to questions, because I, I know there's a lot. The hands are going. The, the hands are going <laughs> crazy, people. Oh my <laughs> God, the they hands. literally are. I've never they literally seen are. So many hands. Hi, Nancy Austin, International Medical Corps. Good to see you, JJ. Good to see you. I'm just curious, um, as, as the profile or the pressure um, is on, whether you know, real or imagined, how do you think, or does that impact on how you view your company culture at Bad Robot and how you keep um, keep doing what you've been doing so well, despite all the things that happen, you know, kind of outside. And does it affect your people? Does the way you think, uh, think about it impact on anything that you do going forward? You and Katie, I should say. Well, first of all, um, congratulations on your extraordinary work that you've done. Um, I would say that the, uh, the, the pressure is, in a weird way, uh, the, the, the right kind of pressure is a reminder that we're actually playing the game. And mm. whenever things get really bad, whether I'm on the set and I realize, oh my God, I gotta figure this out, or I, and I can't, there are tons of <laughs> examples that I can give of that, or when I'm writing something and I don't know how to solve it or whatever it is, or at the company, I literally stop sometimes and, and remind myself, if someone had told me you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, that I would have this problem to solve, and it just immediately makes my shoulders go down a little bit, it makes me relax, because I think, oh, it's just, it, this is an opportunity. And I know that there aren't, sometimes the problems aren't that, that easy, but part of it is that. Part of it is it's par for the course, and part of it is having people that you can say, uh, this is really insane, what's going on right now, and then get through that so you can actually get to the task of, at hand and, and try, to, try to solve it. But I think, like with, with all the, the jobs we all have, it, there is, there's a constant there's always a fire somewhere and there's always something that needs to be put out and sometimes a fire gets overwhelming and it's not a bad idea to just step back and, and maybe even get some help from the outside, which, which happens a lot too. Yes. Hi, uh, Krista uh, Coral, CEO of Open Table. Uh, I was actually at Disney when uh, they acquired Lucas and do remember Kathy Kennedy saying, this is gonna be the first $2 billion movie ever, so congratulations <laughs> on, on having the first $2 billion movie ever. Oh, uh, my question is actually around the Ray doll controversy, yes. and, I, and I'm curious, uh, did you even know that that was happening at the time? And uh, you know, I assume that's going to be corrected in the future, but, but the notion that you know, a boy's not going to play with a girl doll sort of played into it that it wasn't even felt like unconscious bias. It felt conscious almost. Uh, I hear you. Well, first of all, um, obviously 
when Larry Kazan and I wrote the script, the idea was, let's put a female at the center of this story because why not? And we found ourselves, uh, you know, uh, deeply connected to this character, hoping that it would it would resonate not just with women and girls. Uh, I was with a writer a couple weeks ago who told me a story about his seven-year-old son and five-year-old daughter, uh, and uh, the son had an another boy with them. And the three of them, uh, three of the kids, went to go see the movie uh, with the father. And then that night they were home and they were all playing. And he heard the two boys and the girl arguing over who got to play Ray because they were gonna, they were playing Star Wars. And I thought, oh my God! Even if that's the only ex example in the world of that happening, you know, Larry and I got our you know our, our dream came true. Um, the idea that there would be action figures, sets of action figures. She's the lead in the, in the movie, and she would be absent from the set of five action figures. You know, for me, uh, is, is a horrendous misjudgment and miscalculation. And I think, like many things, uh, I, I think the company's responsible immediately realized what was going on, immediately realized how uh, short-sighted they were. Uh, and Clearly, it is being rectified. There were a lot of apologies. There were quick, fast-track plans to get you know uh, these figures out in the world. Now, of course, there are Ray figures, but it was I'm hoping at least in the world of Star Wars, the very last time that uh, girls are excluded or or assumed not to be a participant in playtime, which seems uh, in this moment crazy. But I, at the time, I was shocked. I did not know about it. Obviously, I was focused on the movie, and there are so <laughs> many. Uh, aspects of the marketing of Star Wars that still today when I was flying here, I walked by a store at the airport at LAX and I saw uh, a, a Kylo Ren Bluetooth speaker. I mean, there are things that, that <laughs> I, I'm like, really, you know? Do we need that? But, um, I bought one. No, I bought one. <laughs> yes, Yeah. Hi, uh, Tessie Topol. I oversee corporate social responsibility at Time Warner Cable. My question is about Good Robot. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a two-parter. The first is, what was your inspiration for launching it? Was there a, a single moment, a signature moment? And since you've launched it, have there has there been anything about it that surprised you in terms of what it has done or not done uh, yes. for, for Bad Robot and for the community? Thank I'm, you. Thank you. I'm so glad you asked this question. First of all, uh, it happened because Katie, my wife, said we should have good robot, and <laughs> and she is so smart about uh, culture building and about what is important to people beyond the work, and it is frankly something I never would have thought of, but I immediately when she said it, um, and if I have any uh, skill at all, it is that I can identify a good idea. Um, and, and so when she, I can't come up with one, but I can say that was good. So she, <laughs> she had Good Robot, uh, she started Good Robot. We brought in Rebecca Goldman, who um, is a terrific executive who Fast Company named one of the most creative, uh, 100 most creative. She has done terrific work uh, uh, with Katie. Uh, good Robot, for example, we were working on Star Trek and uh, Into Darkness, and we realized there was an opportunity to leverage the film, which as a piece of entertainment was one thing, but into something that actually could do some social good. And so we partnered with Mission Continues, er Eric Wrighton's uh, veterans organization, uh, to not just do what typically gets done and have a premiere and say, eh, and it benefits Mission Continues, but to actually from the beginning have Eric come and meet the cast and bring his books, and the crew and the cast were reading his books becoming part of it. We actually had him in the movie and some of his fellows uh, from Mission Continues were, were in the film. Um, and Star Trek, because it was a sort of service-based themed movie, there was a kind of great connection there. And we did Star Wars, uh, Bad Robot, in association with Lucasfilm and Disney, came up with uh, The Force for Change, which was an opportunity to uh, not just do a premiere, but before we even, uh, when the first day of shooting, the first week uh, of shooting, we debuted this thing. It was a, an Omaze auction. Uh, for people to uh, s sign up to get a, a, a be in the film, um, and over the course of uh, of production and and then the release of the film, we raised uh, ten million dollars for UNICEF Innovation Labs, uh, and this is money that would have been left on the table. And what amazed me is, despite Disney having this 
massive machine that we're all aware of. Uh, despite Paramount having never gotten involved in a kind of charitable component in that way, both of these companies uh, were wildly enthusiastic about this and supportive, and it worked. Uh, we do a ton of work uh, locally as well, and things that watching the majority of the, of the employees at Bad Robot uh, get involved, sometimes on weekends, whether it's, it's food drives, um, uh, various projects, but to see people uh, contribute, what ends up happening, and I, you've all seen this, who, any of you who, uh, you know, uh, you're so far ahead of me, but um, you see a culture begin to form on its own. I know it's a stupid thing to say, but when I see someone walking down the hall wearing a bad robot cap, or wearing you know, a, a shirt from a charitable softball game that they play with the bad robot you know, logo on the back, and I feel like there are these little indicators that something is happening that is beyond what we could have imagined, and it ends up being a byproduct of not just you know, being involved in one of the bigger movies of the season, it's about being involved in helping UNICEF. It's, it's being involved in helping the community. And I think that it's, it's the aggregate experience that people talk about who work there at the company, that it's not just a production company. It's a place where things happen beyond the, the walls of, of, of the building. And I'm glad you brought up Katie, because I think anyone who's met you and Katie realizes that you're the least impressive part of that relationship. <laughs> um, I mean, if you need to state the obvious. <laughs> yes, Charles. I think, we, I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, Tim, if you don't mind bringing him a microphone. You know, uh, it's no longer showing up there, but uh, the framing of this session was uh, building, uh, you know, a company that will only last for a few years. Now, clearly, you know, Bad Robot itself is sort of the yeast at the core of a culture that you spread to really, I, I don't know how many people work on, a, on one of these movies, but it's, it's a heck of a lot more than 80 people. And so I, I wonder if you can tell us what that teaches us about how companies you know, can be formed and have kind of a cont continuity of culture in a world where, of ad hoc coalitions where employees come and go, uh, because that really does seem in many ways to be uh, an important trend that's shaping the future. Mm. Well, thank you. Uh, first of all, I will say when I saw the title of this talk, I thought maybe Charles knows, knows something I don't. Uh, <laughs> about bad robot, but um, ask about that later. But um, there are a couple things. First of all, there is Bad Robot, which as a company is something that uh, I hope does en endure for a while. The interesting thing about going into a movie or uh, a, a pilot, less a series, is that they are, they're campaigns with a, sh a short shelf life, that you know three months, six months, hence, you're not going to be working with these people in this way. So everyone kind of goes in saying, I'm with you, I'm your partner on this, for as long as it lasts, everyone knowing, you know, in November, I've got another gig, you know. Um, the beauty of that is that you, you know, you dive in and you kind of, you all have the same finish line. Uh, the, the heartbreak of that is that day comes and you say goodbye to people that you, you've loved working with. But it's sort of taught me that, that I've worked with the same people again and again and again and again. And uh, though I think, and I heard some of this uh, in a conversation earlier uh, here, that because lifetime employees uh, are sort of a thing of the past, the idea that you, you just know you're not gonna be working with someone forever. I feel like at Bad Robot, uh, there have been people with whom I've worked, but in different capacities, um, but I've worked with them again and again. Some have gone, some have come back. There have been writers who you know, I've parted ways with and, and, and we've come back together again. I think the sort of natural sort of flow of, of uh, the community that it makes me feel like we are part of something far bigger than Bad Robot. And what I'm hoping happens, I'm hoping, this sounds wrong to say, but I'm, I'm hoping people leave because I think that some of the things that we're doing at Bad Robot have value. And the beauty would be to see some of these things start to happen elsewhere. I am in no way feeling like we're doing everything right. We've got a lot to figure out, a lot to fix, a long way to go. You know? But I do feel like there are aspects, and I just hear this anecdotally, uh, 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 of what we do at Bad Robot that I think could be valuable sort of seeds planted elsewhere. And uh, just as we learn from companies that are doing certain things better, um, I I'd like to think that as these people, you know, in various capacities go off to work on other projects, that they will spread some of the culture that, that we uh, are at least trying to develop in-house. 
So let me ask one more question. So let, let's say you're, you're 24 today, right? You're talking to, to J.J. Abrams at 24. It, the world that, that someone's leaving college into that's becoming a professional for the first time is radically different than the world that we, you and I found when we left college. What, what advice do you give them? What, what do you tell someone about what, the, what they need to be for the workplace that 10 years from now? Well, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like uh, what, I, what I would say, you know, creatively, I think that it is, it is, it is, a, it is a different world um, in, in most every way, given what you are able to do, what, what, you know, what you and I have in our pockets, tools that allow us to tell stories and, and distribute them uh, you know, internationally instantly. Um, it's, it's an amazing thing. I, I, for a creator, I would say, just go make the thing you want to make. Like there is, There's no barrier anymore. It, it used to be that typically <laughs> white dudes had to give you a camera. Um, now everyone has the camera. It's, it's with them all the time. Um, so for those people, I'd say there is no excuse anymore. Now we all know people who talk about doing the job. You know, I mean, they say there are people who you know make bombs, and there are people who make bomb threats. It's like there are a lot of people who who talk about uh, what they want to do. It's the people who actually write or make or direct that that uh, are already uh, in in you know in in a small. Uh, they're already an elite group because they're just they're actually doing the thing. Um, in terms of someone who wants to you know who wants to just wants to work, the only thing I can say, and this is probably so beneath you guys to even hear this, but is, uh, is given all the opportunities that are there uh, in, in the world, to try and figure out the thing that actually makes you want to get up in the morning, the thing that you actually love. I just, I just know that if I weren't lucky enough to have, uh, have, have been given the opportunity to write a movie or a show or direct anything or produce anything, I would still go home from whatever that day job is and I would try to do it because I love it, not because I really want to make a certain amount of money. Uh, it's great to be comfortable. Uh, it can be dangerous to be comfortable, but it's great to be comfortable. Um, but I, I, I just feel like if you can figure out the thing that makes you tick, um, find that thing. And a lot, the other thing I would say, I guess, is a lot of young people, I find, are under such pressure there's a kind of sense of it's all or nothing, which I think is really unfair. Meaning, I don't know if it's the media and the way things are presented, or if it's because there's so much success that is, that is celebrated uh, in society, but there is a sense I've heard enough that I feel like I haven't thought of this till now, that it is a kind of theme, that, that young people feel like if they don't know what they're born to do, that they're somehow broken. And I think that it needs to be looked at differently, which is that it means if you don't know that thing, it means that every door is, is the possibility. That, that's a beautiful thing. So I just feel like I would say don't stress yourself out. You know, The only reason I could deal with the pressure on Star Wars is because I fucking loved making that movie. And, and if, it, if it didn't work, of course I would have been crushed, but it, I wasn't doing it because it was a job. And if you can find that thing, and deal with the pressure of maybe not making the amount of money that you would like to yet, or not getting to the company you'd like to yet, or not having success with your startup yet. These are all things that I think you can swallow if the thing you're doing speaks to you. Is what you love. JJ, thank you so much. Thank I you really appreciate hearing oh, from you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.